There we go. Let's make sure that all that are joining us online hear us and know that we are together as one family. So good morning, church. It is good to be together both in person and online. I welcome you this morning. If you're worshiping with us online, I hope that you will let us know you are there in our comments section. Share your prayers there. Uh, greet one another with peace and love at throughout this service. Um, I would also remind those that are at home that you can get our bulletin and our newsletter from our website. So if you want to do that in the day or two before the service, you're welcome. Uh, if you would like those mailed, we can do that as well. For those of you who are in person this morning, there is an insert in your bulletin that will tell you about the ministries that are happening in this season of Lent. So I want to remind you um, to take a look at those. Let me just remind you quickly that um, Monday through Thursday, I post a morning devotion to our Facebook page. Even if you are not Facebook people, and I am not a Facebook people, person, so I can relate. Uh, you can go onto our Facebook page and look at that uh, at, at any point, at your time and your convenience, but it's out early so that those who uh, are up early and doing their devotion time early might be able to do that as well. Note that um, I was looking at one book to do those, but lately, um, starting this week, there is so much material in the chapters of the book we're following for this worship series that I will be looking at Tom Berlin's book that we're studying here on Sunday mornings for our morning devotions because I can't capture it all on a Sunday morning. So I, I invite you to flesh them out with me, the chapters, through our morning devotions. Also, on Tuesday, we have Power of Prayer. The community is welcome to join us. Um, this past Tuesday, we prayed for the Ukraine community primarily. Um, and so I invite you to come and join us in a time of prayer. If you can stay at 7 o'clock will be our Bible study, and that Bible study is entitled Hearts Unbound. Um, it is a Bible study that's a 10-week study. Each week we look at a different biblical story and try to put ourselves in how it feels to be welcomed or not welcomed into community. And what does that look like? What does that look like for today? So I invite you into that Bible study. Wednesdays, the AACC is doing a worship service every Wednesday via Zoom. If you have any trouble with this technology, please let us know and we'll help you navigate through it. Um, I was on last Wednesday. I preached not until the 23rd, but it was wonderful to uh, be inspired by the word of one of my colleagues in, in town here. Uh, so I would invite you to take a look on Wednesday evenings if you are available at 7 p.m. via Zoom. So you'll also note that over on our table over here, last week we started to encourage people to take them. They are wooden crosses. They are not cookies, as some people said that they look like. Um, but they are wooden crosses that we hope during Lent, I hope during Lent, through all of our journey as we draw closer to the cross and closer and deeper in our relationship with God and Jesus Christ, that as you're in your devotion time, as you're praying, you might take your cross and hold it. 
Um, it is made so that your fingers can wrap around it, your hand can wrap around it. Uh, so it is my hope that this small item will help you deepen your journey of discipleship with God. We also are doing hygiene kits. Please note that if you can bring us items, our youth group next week will be putting those together. So that's all on your insert. Again, it's on our newsletter that goes out weekly. It is on our um, website. So I hope that you will join us as we deepen our journey of discipleship in this season of Lent. So as we come together, it is a joy but it is also in community that we pray for one another, that uh, we support and encourage one another. So are there prayers that you would like to name for us this morning? Okay, Joseph was it? Justin, I'm sorry. So we pray for Justin. We pray for all those who are deployed in this time in various locations throughout our world and for, uh, for their work and their dedication to the care of our community. Thank you. Others? Can you give me that first name again, Grace? Sam. We keep Sam in our prayers. Absolutely. Um, and we also pray for Barbara Brown, who's recuperating from surgery. Are there others? So Melissa, your friend, Kevin, we can absolutely keep her in prayer as she recuperates. Thank you. Others? We come together in prayer and praise of who God is through one another here online in the community. And so I would invite us as we begin this time of worship to stand and turn and greet one another with signs of peace and love.
please join me in the invitation to worship. When we seek justice for one another, when we love kindness more than ever, we live as God asks us to live. When we walk humbly through life, when we offer mercy and compassion to those who hurt, we are the blessing God hopes we will be. When we are willing to follow the teachings and examples of Jesus, when we listen to our God-inspired convictions and courageously act, we reflect the one who is in our midst. Please join in the song of praise, Be Thou My Vision, uh, United Methodist Hymnal 451, verses 1 and 2, or on the screens. join in the prayer of conviction of courage. Creator God, you call your people to do justice, to love mercy and kindness, and to walk humbly before you. You call us to act courageously. We can only do this through the power of your Holy Spirit. So we surrender ourselves to you and give you control over our lives. Give us opportunities to act when conviction rises up in us. We ask this in the name of Jesus the Christ, who lived by strength and conviction of courage. Amen. I invite our young disciples to join me. this morning. So I brought a, a spoon with me. See my spoon? Um, as you can see, Lydia and I were going to um, have ice cream last night, and I grabbed a spoon rather than the ice cream scooper, and look what can happen, yeah. right? When it's really hard, my, my spoon got bent. And, and so then, if you try to drink soup with your spoon, if you hold it the way you usually do, how successful am I? Not very successful, right? This is just not really good. So this morning, our, the Bible lesson that Mrs. Church's going to read in just a few minutes is about s two people who get bent out of shape like my spoon. The first one, so the story is that Jesus is in the synagogue, the Jewish uh, place of worship, just like we are this morning. And what happens is um, a woman comes into worship just as we have, but she's bent over, okay? Now, I don't know if any of you have ever seen someone who is bent over and even has to walk bent over. She's bent over. She's probably, I'm going to guess, it doesn't say this, but she's probably in a great deal of pain because her spine has something wrong with it, okay? That, that bone, that, that part of our body that 
causes us to be straight or bent or curved. And so she's bent over, and Jesus is in the synagogue, just like Jesus was in the synagogue last week um, when we looked at the scriptures, because we're looking at Luke during this season of Lent. And, And he sees this woman, and he looks over, and he invites the woman to get up. And he touches her, and he heals her. And for the first time after 18 years, this woman can stand up straight. Wow. But you know what happened next? The leaders, the people, the the priests, the, uh, uh, the, the rabbis rather, the rabbis, the leaders, people like myself and others who lead our worship service got upset. They got bent out of shape because Jesus worked on the Sabbath, on the day of worship. And what does the Ten Commandments tell us, right? Don't work on the Sabbath. And so they got all bent out of shape because they were so worried about the rules. Now, rules are important, right? Rules help us learn to live in community. Rules are, are, are vital. But sometimes we can take our rules so strict that we miss something that needs to happen. And that is exactly what happened. A woman was bent out of shape that God wanted her to be in. And a person got bent out of shape because they were upset about what Jesus did. And so what we need to remember is sometimes we need to look and understand the rules, but sometimes we need to look with the eyes of care and compassion like Jesus did for someone. We need to look at them as a person and, and understand that they may need something from us and that they and God may be asking us to do something. And so this Lent, we are talking about courage, that which is in us and inspired by God to help us see something and make a change. And so rather before we get bent out of shape for something, sometimes we need to take a step back and think about what is really happening and what needs to happen. What would God want us to do? Jesus knew, and Jesus did it. And so when something happens and somebody starts to get upset, pause and see if we need to get bent out of shape over what's happening. See if it causes us to look with compassion and eyes, eyes of care. So I want to invite us to be in prayer because there are many things in our world, in our communities, in our schools, in our work that maybe are happening that we need to take another look at. And so I want to ask God to open our eyes to give us the vision to see where God wants us to be, agents of courage and change. So let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for Jesus who teaches us and shows us what it looks like to see the world through eyes of compassion and care for all your people. So help us see, Lord, those in need. Amen. So now let us center ourselves as we go to hear this word of scripture. We turn to the Gospel of Luke 13, chapter 13, verses 10 through 17. 
Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. A woman was there who had been disabled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and couldn't stand up straight. When he saw her, Jesus called to her and said, woman, you are set free from your sickness. He placed his hands on her and she straightened up at once and praised God. The synagogue leader, incensed that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, responded, there are six days during which work is permitted. Come and be healed on those days, not on the Sabbath day. The Lord replied, hypocrites, don't each of you on the Sabbath untie your ox or donkey from its stall and lead it out to get a drink? Then this isn't it necessary that this woman, a daughter of Abraham, bound by Satan for 18 long years, be set free from her bondage on the Sabbath day? When he said these things, all his opponents were put to shame, but all those in the crowd rejoiced at all the extraordinary things he was doing. May God bless our reading, hearing, and understanding. Thanks be to God. to a world in 
Lydia and Anthea, thank you. That was beautiful. So my friends, will you pray with me? Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth will be anointed by your spirit, that they will be beneficial to all receiving them this day. Lord, I pray that we might be courageous people and think about the ways that you would form us in that way. That we might go to the ends of the earth as your courageous people. So help us, Lord, to do courageous things with our life that would be inspired in this time of meditation. So, Lord, your servants are listening. Speak to us now. Amen. Friends, this past Monday, March 7th, was the 57th anniversary of Bloody Sunday when John Lewis, Martin Luther King Jr., and 600 courageous Americans, mostly of black descent, marched across the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama, to exercise their constitutional right to vote. These nonviolent protesters were met by Alabama state troopers who attacked them with billy clubs and tear gas, which resulted in 67 known injuries. Ten years earlier were the Montgomery bus boycotts, which started with a courageous and nonviolent African American woman named Rosa Parks, who refused to give up her seat to a white man because she had had enough of being pushed aside, of being not given worth. And she was met with an arresting officer. Sandwiched between these two historical movements of civil rights action are the lunch counter sit-ins. Lunch counters that refuse to permit our black neighbors to be served because white people didn't want to use utensils pre previously used by a black person. That included plates, glasses, and silverware, to name a few things. Students in Greensboro, North Carolina, started these peaceful sit-ins that grew in number, but unfortunately resulted in punitive discrimination laws that included trespassing arrests. These momentous actions in our U.S. history speak of the courageous acts of citizens who had clarity and conviction, which inspired courage to arise and take action that they knew would be met with significant disruption. Courage that was rooted in their understanding that all individuals are God's beloved, created in the image of God and equal. This is where we continue our Lenten worship series, Courageous Faith, based on Reverend Tom Berlin's book, Courage, Jesus and the Call to Brave Faith. Last Sunday, we began this series exploring the need for clarity and purpose to engage in courageous faith, modeled by Jesus. Today, we look at the courageous actions that come from a set of convictions based on how I see things, how I want to live, how I believe society should be ordered a personal moment when you realize something has got to change. A conviction 
that I must do something. I must be part of the change. Two years ago, today actually, when our nation went in shutdown due to the pandemic, it was the medical communities and the scientific communities that became convicted to protect life and courageously risk their own to aid the community in need, all of us. It was churches like our own feeding and providing for others. In the civil rights movement, it was to stand for the rights of our neighbors. These past two weeks, it has been seen in the people who are standing up against Russian aggression, courageous people acting on their set of convictions that required them to make a change. In media just this week, we have seen one man approaching a tank and beginning to lash out at this combat vehicle. Seemingly out of nowhere, another man is seen jumping in front of one of those tanks and trying to stop it by pushing it backwards. When the tank grinds to a sudden halt, the man drops to one knee. Others watching on quickly moved in to help him, fearing for his safety, and they pulled him away. The man held on to the tank and refused to budge. The move echoed scenes from Tenement Square when Tank Man illustrated nonviolent resistance while standing up to Chinese forces in June of 1989. Courageous Ukrainians have been seen attempting to ward off invaders since Putin launched his assault on Ukraine. While a brave Ukrainian soldier blew himself up to destroy a bridge and stop Russian forces from storming towards Kiev. We have seen grandmothers and grandfathers taking up arms to save their loved ones. Someone posted a photo of an 80-year-old who showed up to join the army, carrying with him a small suitcase that held two t-shirts, a pair of extra pants, a toothbrush, and a few sandwiches for lunch. Love that part. He said he was doing it for his grandchildren. We all like stories of courage where the hero saves the day, where the world's Davids defeat Goliath. Yet, my friends, I am here to tell us and remind us that courage takes a cost. Jesus knew about the cost of courage. As was Jesus' habit, he went to the temple on Saturday, the Sabbath, he notices a woman who is bent over for 18 years. Now think about how painful it would be if every step you took had a problem with your spine. Friends, I know some of us know what that feels like because we have seen our loved ones go through that. I think in this moment, Jesus sees her as an oppressed woman and wants to set her free. Courageously, Jesus calls the woman over, even though he knows it is going to be disruptive and will be met with much resistance. She comes, he lays hands on her, and then he pronounces her healed. Her back straightens, and for the first time in all those years, this woman goes from bent over to upright. And I'm going to say, probably pain-free for the first time in 18 years. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the scene, that happening right here? I would hope that the minute that happened, we would all go into immediate celebration, right? Joyfully 
excited for this woman, for what Jesus had done. But no, no. Instead, a leader of the synagogue calls Jesus out for what he has done on the Sabbath. The day for no work, and we all know healing is work. Really? An amazing act, yet this unbelievable part of the story turns to the resistance Jesus faces because he breaks the rules. Jesus brings change, and it is met with angered resistance. We do not like change, folks. It's in our history. In this act at the synagogue, Jesus fulfills a vow that he made at his hometown synagogue of Nazareth to free the oppressed. A vow we heard last week in Luke 4. And if you remember, that didn't go well either. His neighbors wanted to throw Jesus off a cliff. Now the leaders are angered that Jesus would perform this miracle on the Sabbath. Could they not see what just happened? Did they not want this woman to be healed and stop her suffering? What is going on here? Did they believe nothing could ever be done here? Had they been saying what I hear at times our culture saying? It is what it is. Or maybe the synagogue leaders are ashamed. Maybe it is the struggle with a carpenter's son, a teacher showing up and showing them up. Maybe it's this power dynamic between them. Or maybe they are just rule followers. It is in the Ten Commandments not to work. But does healing fall under that title of work when it is so miraculous? They did say she could come Monday through Saturday, but not Sunday. But don't they work with their animals on the Sabbath for their well-being? That's what Jesus asked. And this woman, a child of God's, doesn't deserve more than their animals? Whatever the reason, we recognize and relate to the fact that courage is disruptive. In Jesus' act of compassion, the leaders can only see the disruption of the rules. In God's action of love, right here in the synagogue, is missed by the leaders who only see a disruption to their planned worship service. Courage is disruptive in your life and disruptive to all those around you, all those people. So rather than honor this synagogue leader's in indignation with an apology or walk back a miracle by asking, would it be all right if I, I straightened her just a degree or two um, until the sun goes down on the Sabbath? No, Jesus doesn't do that. Instead, he speaks on her behalf. In the moment of conflict, Jesus teaches us something about courage. Courage arises from the God-inspired convictions we hold about how the world should work and what we should do to support others in our community, in our neighbors, in our world. Jesus teaches us <coughs> that it is important, it is necessary to hold convictions that are rooted in God's love and mercy, that he knew were taught by the prophets Isaiah and Micah. Jesus shows us that we must not defer from action for fear of conflict. When God calls, it is not time to avert our eyes or hope it is intended for someone else, right? Those are the things you did in school, right? So a teacher's looking at you and you went, 
I don't see it. Don't see it. No, with God, that's not going to work, folks. Jesus healed this woman in the synagogue, knowing that he would anger the religious leaders, but he did it anyway. Both Jesus and the leaders had convictions, but the leaders were convicted about the wrong thing, thus ignoring the right thing. Courage is when our conviction and our actions are so aligned that we do the right thing the right way at the right time. The right thing the right way at the right time. So how do we know if our convictions are the right thing, the right way at the right time? We start with faith in Christ. We start with our relationship in Jesus. In your bulletin during this Latin series, I, I left you a blank space. And I'm going to invite you, and you can do it if you'd like. Those at home, you could do it on a piece of paper. But I'm going to tell you where I want, to, want you to write some things, OK? So the first thing I want you to write is right up here, right at the top. I know you can't see it. I was going to bring a whiteboard, but then I decided ah, that's a little much. But so right up here, I want you to put faith in Jesus, right in the top, right under that bold heading, faith in Jesus. We start with our relationship with Jesus. Because the teachings of Christ give us a worldview, folks. We begin to develop what matters and what doesn't matter. We decide what we want to focus on and what we want to ignore. That's what loving Jesus will do. Jesus will show us how to live. In our relationship with Christ, we will have a conviction. OK, there's another word for you. Only this time it goes on the right-hand side over here, a little lower to the right. A conviction to do something, to be part of something, to fix something, to encourage something, to show love, to show compassion, just as Jesus did. That comes from our deep understanding of the prophets of Isaiah and Micah again. For their prophetic works in scripture, Jesus lives his mission and ministry to model God-inspired convictions that shows us exactly what courageous faith looks like. But before we courageously act like Jesus did with the woman in the synagogue, we must filter our convictions through what Tom Berlin calls a Jesus filter. OK, another word for your diagram here. Now you're a little lower, right in the middle. Jesus filter. So we got faith in Jesus, conviction, Jesus filter. A Jesus filter asks, is this something Jesus would do himself? Does this sound like something that Jesus is about? Does this make sense from a Christian point of view? When I read the Gospels, is this something that the Jesus of Nazareth would actually do. So we're filtering our convictions and where they're coming from in us. Are they God-inspired? This is vitally important, my friends. Think for a moment of people, Christians, who had convictions to act, yet what they did went counter to the work and ministry of Jesus. Their intended ministry, what they did, actually wasn't laid next to the gospel and thus was hurtful and harmful. They didn't ask what Jesus would have them do right. And so it's important for us to lay our convictions next to these questions of discernment and to take time to think about is what I'm convicted to do what Jesus wants me to do? Is it acts of Christianity that show Jesus' love, compassion, and kindness? When we have faith in Jesus, 
that leads to conviction, that filters through discernment, then we get to courageous action. The fourth, far left, under faith in Jesus. And if you'll notice, you're making a circle. You're making a circle. Will it lead us to courageous action again and again? And if so, if it leads us to courageous action, I promise you it will deepen your faith in Jesus. It is circular. But friends, if we aren't convicted in life, it does not lead to courageous faith and we become stagnant. This is why we do mission trips. This is why we work on mission opportunities like hygiene kits and distribute them on the streets of Atlantic City. This is why we collect food and find other food pantries that we can share with because it is transformational. We are doing the ministry and, ministry, ministry and mission of Jesus as told to us through the prophets. We are living out our discipleship when we're in courageous actions. We must act on the things we believe. Otherwise, we don't get this thing called faith. Or maybe we do it mildly and it doesn't register. Living courageous faith means getting involved. It means taking a risk on behalf of others. This is what Jesus did and showed with the healing of this woman. My friends, I promise you that when we show up with courageous faith, we then have the witness and the testimony because God walks with you and I on the path. And in those ministries, we will bring glory to God. But it all begins with our relationship with Jesus. And as I shared last week, that happens as we read scripture. So pick any gospel in this Lenten season. Pick any gospel and continue it beyond Lent. And start reading and then take time to be in prayer in solitude with God. There is an ancient theologian, Abelard. That's all we know of his name. He understood this idea very well. And he, under, and he understood it so well that he introduced the idea to all others. That the cross meant more than they were saying or understood. He talked about the cross in a different way than anybody had ever before. He believed that the cross offered more than just forgiveness of sins, and not that that's just. But he believed there was something more happening in the cross. He believed that if you read the Gospels and looked at the life of Jesus, then you see Jesus on the cross in a painful, sacrificial way, and you will learn what love is. He believed by watching Jesus' life, you would learn what love is. By listening to his teaching, you would learn what wisdom is. By seeing him on the cross, you would see what servanthood really was, what sacrifices and what courage is. So why, this is why it's so appropriate for us to look at the sin line. Because we need to look at Jesus' life as we journey to that cross. Abelard said all, that, all of that together changes us. Abelard called the, that the moral atonement theory. By looking at the life and death of Jesus, we are transformed. So look at your diagram. When we look at the life and death, we are transformed which leads us to convictions about how we should live. Validate it through the Jesus filter, which then leads us to courageous actions. Or as Abelard said, Jesus came in human form to show us how to be human. 
Jesus had God-inspired conviction of how God wanted the world to be because Jesus was God incarnate. So now go back with me to the lunch counters and the bus boycotts where more were joining in the sit-ins, where others were not riding the buses, where others were driving carloads so that they could still get to work on time since they weren't riding the buses. Movements that continued over time, over years. Movements that gained numbers of people. Movements that ensured the protesters would be thrown out, beaten, and jailed. So what sustained these people in their convictions? Faith and faith communities. We say that again. What sustained these people in these hard movements of, of hardship and pain and physical beating was faith and faith communities. In John Lewis's book, Across the Bridge, if you haven't read it, please read it. He tells us that when we look at the history of the movement, we will see mostly Christian people who were attending church and understood Christian community, who understood supporting each other, who understood love, who understood that we are all beloved children of our God. Their conviction arose out of their faith, and that's how it renewed itself, sustained itself when they came under the resistance they all faced. It's true of all great movements, my friends. The civil rights movement was the conviction of courageous faith to move beyond oppression. How might God be leading you in courageous faith today? How might God be leading our church in courageous faith in this time and place in history? This is why it is important for us as individuals and the church to gather, to study, to pray, and to revision our ministry according to the teachings and life of Jesus. What convictions are stirring in you through the life and ministry of Jesus? What are the injustices and oppressions, many that we have named in the last three weeks from this pulpit, that are calling us into action as a church? Are you willing to re-engage and deepen your faith in Christ this Lent by making a commitment to worship, to study, to prayer, so that we might know courageous faith. Each Sunday, I'm going to invite us at the end of each sermon to close our time in a moment of reflection. While it's still fresh in our heads, just to pause. There's a couple questions in your, in your bulletin that may guide you. But take some time Make some notes. Sit with God in this communal setting to think about how God is calling you in courageous faith now, here, at this time, in this place, in this history of our world. Amen.
teacher, our example, our companion. You have shown us what is good. Your ministry has clarified our purpose as disciples. You have taught us what conviction and courage look like. And you call us to remember that what you require is not repayment of debt or settling of score, but obedience to a faithful walk with you and to serve our neighbors in love. Today, we come with heavy hearts and minds that can barely keep up with the breaking news. We don't know what to say or what to do in a world so wounded. So we come to you for your comforting presence. God of peace, be with the people of Ukraine. Be with the brave protesters in Russia. Be with us all as we look on. Show us how to respond. God of comfort, help us also look around at our families, our friends, our communities, and respond to all the needs of today. Give us eyes to see, voices to speak, and ears to listen as we share our prayers with you. Barbara. Terry. Show us, God, when to do justice, how to love kindness, and where to walk humbly with you as we pray together the prayer you have taught. Our loving God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, power, and the glory forever. Amen. I invite us to respond to the graciousness and the gifts of God by bringing our offerings, our tithes to God. So let us give generously so that we might be in continue in ministries of love. For your ministry and your compassion. You healed all those that approached you in faith. Your ministry of bold and brave love calls us into action toward the injustice in the world. Bless these offerings we now bring, that they may be instruments to engage in the conviction of our faith. Give us the strength and the courage to overcome all adversities and bring about your kingdom. Amen. Let us join together in our song of dedication, Where He Leads Me. Give us just a moment. We're going to sing verses 1 and 4.
words for us. These were words that Jesus knew when he went in that synagogue that Sunday. He has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? Friends, we are called in this season of Lent to find our way back or renew our faith in Christ, to walk with God humbly, because when we do, we find our convictions to do justice and to love kindness. We find our courageous faith that calls us into action that is still so needed in our communities, in our nation, and in our world. So I invite you to continue this Latin journey with me on morning devotions, in prayer time on Tuesday, Bible study on Tuesday, Sunday following these services, chat back in our chapel, that we continue to flush this out in our lives and in the life of our church. So may we go forth to walk humbly with God as we follow the teachings of Jesus to do justice and to love kindness. Amen.